Hello, everyone. Four years ago, I began to knit. It was a short-lived, hormone-fueled obsession. <laughs> my daughter was pregnant with the first of my three grandchildren. The birth of this infant changed my world. The future suddenly mattered very much again, and making a difference took on new urgency. Making a difference, say, to my home city of Birmingham, here in the English Midlands. It's a good place to live, friendly, clean too, with cheerfully competent refuse collectors. That matters. It's also a green city, literally so. Once part of the ancient forest of Arden, it is a city of trees, millions of them, including nearly 100,000 street trees. In autumn, our streets, you know what's coming, our streets are paved with gold, but not of the precious metal variety. As with many post-industrial cities, it has been in economic decline since the 1980s. Mass unemployment, particularly among the young, and likely to stay. Along with Glasgow, it is the most unequal city in the country. But Birmingham, right there at the start of the Industrial Revolution, has always been a crucible of ideas. Our industrial legacy is not just engineering and technology, it's also medicine. Think 19th century factory accidents and disease caused by the sudden influx of a population. So today, we have scientists and medics at the forefront of research. How could, I wondered, these engineers and scientists, working on everything from fuel cells to stem cells, help us make a better future for the next generation? And given not just our particular social situation, also the huge global threats facing humanity, climate change, resource depletion, population pressures. Specifically, at what scale could their intervention make a difference? For it's the scale of these challenges that makes it so hard for governments, let alone individuals. Human cognition can't handle it. Their multifactorial issues across vast geographies and time spans. So, at what scale? A local geography, Birmingham, it's where I live. A time span within everyone's grasp, 2050. Okay, my skin may not be in that game, but the people I love, those infant grandchildren, they will be around. And a subject matter that's part of our everyday lives. Thus, over the last year or so, regional scientists have been bending their minds on a scenario planning project about food. What possible food futures are there for Birmingham? What will we be eating in 2050? It's been an illuminating project, and there's one aspect of it, urban agriculture, local food growing, that I'm going to talk about. But first, some basics. How much food do we need? The relevant information is in your kitchen cupboard. For example, the label of a can of baked beans. For there, you can find the guideline daily um, um, amount, i.e. what nutrients each of us needs for a healthy diet. That label tells us that we need 2,000 calories a day. How much food does Birmingham need? There are a million of us in the city, so 2,000 times 1 million is 2 billion calories a day. 2 billion calories today, tomorrow, and every day. A moment's diversion to the hard-to-comprehend global scale. 
There will be nine billion people by 2050. So 2,000 times nine billion is 18 trillion calories a day of food to feed the world's population. And where is it going to come from? Let's assume some ideal conditions. One hectare of land, intensively farmed, highly fertile anyway, under the right weather conditions, can support 10 people. Note, however, that the United Nations figures are less than half of that. And let's explore where it doesn't come from. Birmingham, for example. That square is equivalent to 200 hectares. So were it highly fertile, were it intensively farmed, it could support 2,000 people at best. The city center itself, there are 30,000 people living right in the city center, and 160,000 people commute in there every day. So how much food is grown in the city? On allotments, gardens, community orchards and the like. Well, there are some stats for Brighton and Hove, slightly less densely populated than Birmingham. There, 0.14% of what they eat is grown within their city boundaries. Put it another way, 99.9% .9 just about of what we eat in cities comes in on planes, trucks, and trains. Cities do not feed bodies. They never have done. Cities feed minds, minds that have been shaped by food. So, urban food growing, why should we be interested in it when it produces so little of what we eat? What's it really about? And I've been pondering two questions. The first, how come this urban food growing malarkey, maybe a passing fad, has such beneficial impact, not just on individual lives? Did you know that gardeners have one of the lowest suicide rates of any occupation? But also on our social and civic life. If, for example, a primary school has a well-tended veg patch, obesity and truancy go down, and literacy goes up, how the heck does that happen? Magic? I don't buy magic. Science is the best defense we have against believing what we want to. My second question is this. What's going on in the minds of more than a few urban food growers who hold the belief often vociferously expressed, I think it's akin to my knitting obsession, that horticultural effort within a city can do more than a gnat's whisper to feed its population, despite their very personal battles with slugs and other pests. Despite the downpours here last summer, despite the hard cash they, let alone the rest of us, spend in supermarkets, despite the bricks, the concrete, the tarmac of their daily lives, why does urban agriculture have the impact it does? What's it playing with in our minds? And if we can answer the question why, we will go some way to understand, even predict, other activities that engage a similar passion and have a similar social and civic benefit. Here are three sets of ideas as to why. The first, epidemiologists from all over the world have analyzed data sets. They show that many social dysfunctions, homicide, low educational levels, mortality and ill health, obesity, teenage mums, etc are highly correlated, not with poverty, as you might suppose, but with income inequality. At least one major cue for income inequality is absent on the vegetable patch. 
Turn up with your soft hands newly manicured, a tailored suit and expensive shoes, and you will rightly be seen as a fool. Soil under the fingernails, scruffy old clothes, and mud-encrusted boots are de rigueur on this a feral catwalk. The second set of ideas is from network theory, small worlds, the notion that we are six degrees from each other. Social cohesion and the spread of good ideas depends on the strength of weak ties. That is, people, social hubs with lots of casual friendships, acquaintanceships, not close bonds. Weak ties, casual friendships, abound on allotments, in community gardens and orchards and the like. For veg growing is no respecter of identity. It's there, maybe inactive, but it's there in all our lives, which leads neatly to the third set of ideas from evolutionary psychology. Food growing was part of our ancestral past, our recent past, my early childhood, for example. Every single one of our ancestors knew, intimately knew, the animals and the plants they ate. No wonder so many people today are passionate about what they grow and about the provenance of what they eat. But that's a luxury in the 21st century. It's counterintuitive to our core. But if we are to feed nine billion people, we need ever more intensified agriculture. Thus, our uncomfortable focus needs to be on how, somehow, our food provenance, necessarily distant from us, is adequate and trustworthy, yes, but far, far more important, enables us to be custodians, not pillagers of the planet. So, given the social challenges of cities like Birmingham, and the huge global threats facing us all. What can we do to ensure our children and our grandchildren have happy, fulfilled lives and will leave a better world for their descendants? We need come up with and implement lots of ideas grounded in evidence. Many will conflict. It'll be hard, intellectually hard, perhaps too hard, so emotionally not easy. So why should you or I bother? Here's one, just one, my darling one of nine billion reasons why. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening.